Welcome to our spring edition of HackerRank webinars. First, I would like to thank you all for joining us today to learn more about recruiting the next generation and diversity in tech. Before we get started, let's take a quick moment to orient everyone to the webinar console. Please feel free to ask questions throughout our presentation today using the Q&A dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen. And just to ensure you all can hear us, may I ask someone to please type in hi into that dialog box so that we know that everything is working as it should? Okay, great. Thank you very much. And just under that dialog box, you'll find additional resources related to today's event. Please be sure to check those out. And finally, to the left, left of the presentation box, you'll see widgets for social sharing. We hope you'll share any insights you pick up during today's program with your peers. And if you do share, please use at HackerRank to tag us in your comments so we can join the fun. And with that, let's begin with a quick round of intros. My name is Laura Guntran. I'm a marketing leader here at HackerRank. And today we have the pleasure of speaking with Maria Chung, the VP of HackerRank, and Blaine Shields, Director of Customer Success here at HackerRank. Blaine, Maria, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Hello. Thanks so much. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in. Our topic today is not just devoted to hiring the next generation. It's about Gen Z, women in tech. So why is that important today? Yes, so uh, we have been spending many years um, talking about our millennial generation. Now with the new generation of Gen Z that is entering the job market, we really need to uh, focus on their efforts and how we can support our next generation of coders who will definitely transform the world. Um, we surveyed over 10,000 developers across universities worldwide on how they're learning, what they're learning, and what they're looking for in the job as they're entering the job market. For example, we learned that even though 76% of tech students are pursuing a degree in computer science, um, nearly one-third of them um, actually have uh, completely self-taught themselves. So different avenues of learning rather than just university programs and in schools that they're, they're going to. Yeah. Self-directed learning is definitely the norm among developers, and so when companies focus on hiring based on proven skills instead of a prestigious degree or GPA, a massive pool of overlooked talent opens up. So Blaine, have you seen this come into play as you're helping our customers get up and running on HackerRank? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, we do definitely see this uh, with our customers. They've been uh, very vocal about the, the possible shortage of candidates um, and really having a lot of efforts towards trying to uh, increase diversity, increase their exposure to this new workforce. So um, it's definitely been uh, something we've been hearing on the street for sure. Yeah, I think the prevalence of this self-taught knowledge means two things. First, computer science programs are lagging behind the pace at which technology evolves. And so for the skills that are growing in the industry today, like the latest Node.js, AngularJS, and React frameworks, students are relying on self-teaching to learn. And second, self-teaching is ingrained in the developer DNA. Developers have an insatiable thirst for learning. And on average, students are planning to learn six languages, while more senior developers are claiming they plan to learn four. Um, regionally, students in the Asia-Pacific region, region seem to be the most ambitious, with the average student planning to learn seven or more programming languages. So their thirst for learning makes it clear computer science degrees shouldn't be the primary measure of student developer skills. Instead, teams need to look beyond that skill performance to personal projects, portfolios, skills assessments, and the like to accurately evaluate their skills. So Maria, as we go through our evaluation process, how do we ensure the best talent moves to the top of the list? That's a great question. So, you know, it's not as we have looked through and looked at our results from the developer survey, it's not just about the prestige and brand of schools. It's also looking at potentials and competencies associated with some of these, these positions. So especially as we're looking into um, junior level people coming in that actually may not have a lot of experience, they of course have brought in um, their competencies and their learning. So we have actually have to expand our um, our recruiting um, process and, and practice to ensure that some of these competencies are also being foiled into the recruiting process. Um, so that is another way for us to really expand our, our space um, and also our pool of candidates coming in and not just really specifically looking for a very, very keen set of skills. Mm -hmm. We're definitely going to be losing on that opportunity for looking at more diverse and also more expanded talent. Yep. And Blaine, as uh, you see customers using the HackerRank product, how does the, the evaluation, that skills evaluation, help 
uh, in their recruiting process and ensure they're, they're evaluating diverse talent? Yeah, great question. So, so naturally, by, by utilizing a, a software platform like, like HackerRank, you're um, standardizing the process. Um, so every HR and recruiting team, they want to make sure that every candidate is going through the, the same process as every other candidate. Um, so naturally, what you do, you're, you're eliminating bias or any subjectivity that can creep into every interview process. Um, so we've we've seen a lot of customers provide feedback on how just by adding a standardized process and implementing something like HackerRank, um, it helps them with their diversity numbers and, and kind of reduce that inherent bias that can creep in. Yeah, I, so um, yeah, I think it's important to note that uh, while we might think we are all well-rounded and cultured, there <laughs> are unco uh, unconscious biases that creep in. Simply seeing somebody's name, email address, or mailing yep. address can influence the perception of a resume. So uh, using a skills-based platform helps eliminate a lot of that and really ensures that you've got the right talent coming into your, your pipeline. Definitely. So a lot of people say that uh, you know the, d uh, the lack of diversity in tech has to do with the lack of diversity coming into tech. Yet today, when we look at our studies, more more young women are more likely to pursue a computer science degree compared with women born before 1983. Um, so Maria, have you seen a shift in the number of women applying to computer science related jobs? Um, yes, so we definitely have seen a trend where we are um, seeing more and more younger generations that are actually um, going into STEM and also actually more specifically coding. Um, more personally, you know, I actually have um, you know, eight-year-old nephews that actually wanted a laptop for their birthday um, because they're coding at school. So you definitely have seen more and more um, elementary school, uh, school programs that are actually entering into um, more the STEM sector. And there's an interesting story on code.org that I actually recently watched on 60 Minutes where they were talking about that um, for women, um, you know, it's actually already too late um, by the time that they go into middle school um, to get them excited about science and technology and engineering and math where there are actually um, less and less kids that are going more into or becoming more interested in STEM um, by the time they get into middle school where they actually have already um, have uh, come to a preconceived notion of what they should be going into. Um, and, and they're already conforming to what is their gender kind of perception of what they should be. And so more and more now, these programs are starting very, very early, starting as early as kindergarten to get them really excited and to get them really um, engaged in, in the STEM. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, as schools implement programs such as the Hour of Code, we're going to see a big shift. Um, and of course, uh, even even Barbie's getting into <laughs> the game with science Barbie. So yeah. it's nice to see the shift. Exactly. So we're hoping that next generations to come with more and more engagement in much more younger education, elementary school education, that our future generations will have many more diverse um, backgrounds and, and gender um, that are going into the the tech space, which will be great. All right. We're actually finding in our research that the gender gap in the age of learning to code is shrinking. So in our most recent research, we found that 14% of women and 20.9% 20 of men age 18 to 24 started to learn to code before they were 16, whereas the men and women in the age group of 25 to 34, the difference was uh, 14 to 25%. So that gap is shrinking. Then again, of course, if you look at the 35 plus, it was 42% of men who started to learn to code earlier, where only 22% of women. So I think the shift in the education platforms are, are helping to drive some of those changes. But unfortunately, when we look forward, uh, women of all ages are more likely to be in junior positions. So Maria, as uh, as, a, as a valued leader within the space, what are some career growth plans that for young women to consider as they come into the tech space? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, obviously that's, you know, obviously it is um, really looking at our initial recruiting strategy. What are we really looking for? If they don't actually have a very, very specific skill set, we're looking for competencies. We're looking for how they're able to adapt and how they're able to learn quickly and be able to show that kind of engagement and motivation. And so when they come in, of course, they're not going to have all the knowledge and experience that, that we're looking for. And so what is the question about really growing? 
growing them. And so, you know, having a various um, a step ladder in terms of what it means to get from one level to the next, what are the different criteria, what are the learning um, opportunities that they'll need to have, having those mapped out really provides a very clear um, way of understanding, um, you know, how they can continue to develop in their career. Other things would be very project-based. Um, having a very clear um, uh, line of what they're expected to do, what are different projects, what are their strong sets, what are their passion, what are they're interested in, and getting them involved in those areas uh, will certainly help catapult them into what they uh, are uh, striving to be in their career. Um, so, Blaine and Maria, as we look at recruiting the next generation, it's important that uh, there, there's a, a defined plan. So what are some of the steps that you've seen our customers take as they look to approach the Gen Z market? Yeah, definitely an um, interesting question. We, we do work with customers a lot on figuring out what's the right recruiting strategy, um, especially when they're implementing something like HackRank. Um, sometimes a lot of customers, it can take some time for them to figure out uh, what are those creative ways to, to find candidates and to engage candidates. Um, so spending some time on figuring out your strategy is very important. Um, and then also thinking about what employer brand that you have. Um, are you a very popular brand where you see a lot of inbound applications or do you have to do a lot of reach outs and sourcing efforts? So um, I think as we uh, are starting to recognize that um, you know, what worked with millennials, Gen X, baby boomers, um, it, it might not work with the next generation, right? So what are Gen Zers doing that, um, that we can utilize to, to um, get our brand in, in front of them? So um, thinking about, you know, like all of these, all of these new, um, all of this new workforce, they were born into the age of the internet, right? 25% of them had smartphones before they were even the age of 10, <laughs> which is crazy to think about. Um, so you have to think of multi-channel strategies, right? Um, it's not just emailing and calling. Um, you need to try and experiment with tools. Um, I know there's chatbots and texting programs out there now, um, which automate a lot of the process for recruiters and hiring managers. So um, it's, a, it's a totally different world, and we have to try and understand that um, we have to go outside of our comfort zone and, and think of these new creative ways. Um, so, you know, recruiting campaigns, different multimedia channels, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, um, all ones that I don't even know how to utilize, but <laughs> <laughs> they all grew up with these, right? So um, the more you can just spread the word through these different channels, um, finding a way to drive word of mouth, um, ultimately this generation is going to want to work for companies that they associate with and brands that they recognize. Um, and those brands are typically ones that are on their smartphone, <laughs> right? So if you're not on their smartphone, one, how do you get there? And, um, and then how do you let them know that you are working on really cool projects and products, initiatives? Um, so um, yeah, we've, we've seen uh, a lot of time spent on strategy and figuring out what's the right channels to, to reach uh, the right audience. Absolutely, and also social media plays a really big role in, in really employer branding, especially we're seeing that Gen Z are more likely to uh, look for more prestigious companies or brands um, than non um, than other gen generations. So which means for the companies that actually do not have a, a huge recognition out there in the market, what are some really out-of-the-box strategies that they need to come up with to actually be able to engage with this generation um, Z? Um, and also looking at employer branding from the perspective of even career sites, right? So people are no longer just wanting to look at job description and, and the titles and, and location anymore. It's really getting a, um, a message about how fun and creative and, and hip and, and you know, great company to work for. Those are the things that they're actually now really looking for and in, in making them decide as to which company to, to be selecting as part of their um, opportunity. One of, the, one of the other things that, that we've seen our customers implement um, within HackerRank, we have what's called a diversity feature, uh, which will actually um, obfuscate the, the candidate's name and email address. So you actually uh, can only look at their performance, look at their code, look at their score, looking at the skill uh, versus you know, their name or making any unconscious bias decisions uh, based on that information. So uh, we have seen some really creative strategies at the end of the funnel. Um, you know, once you get the candidates in, once you evaluate them, how do you make sure you're, again, eliminating that unconscious bias? So um, that's been a cool thing that we've seen utilized. All right, so Maria, is we look to attract these, uh, these Gen Z people to uh, smaller organizations. How can a company approach, uh, what, are, what are some tactics that a company can implement uh, to attract 
the attention of these people beyond the social media engagements? How mm-hmm. does, uh, for example, job descriptions, things mm-hmm. of that nature, how can that influence? Yeah, so I mean, there are actually um, pretty interesting recruiting uh, platforms out there that really help with these. Um, you know, some some organizations or some programs actually also offer um, looking at different keywords and job descriptions to help neutralize. And so it's no longer this masculine uh, kind of a job description. So they're helping neutralize that. So it actually gets more um, diverse um, applicants to be should be more open to looking at a company as an example. That's just a very small example of that. Also looking at, as we just talked about, you know, the employer branding is very, very important. And it's not just your typical, um, you know, website or career page, but again, accessing social media sites. But in addition to, um, you know, what are some of the other outreach programs that we need to do? Really looking at a broader scale of how we recruit our talent, it's no longer going to be the top 10 schools we're going to always go to. It's going to be looking at different regions that actually are popping up with some of these new tech hubs or even just rural areas because we have actually have seen a third of uh, our CS uh, program uh, developers that are coming out of school are actually self-taught. So this is just a whole wealth of this great vast of, of a group that are out there that we have not even been, been able to tap yet. So really being much more open in terms of our recruiting process and strategy and, and seeking what are some other avenues that really have not been, been touched before. So that's going to be a really great, great way to do that. Okay. And so I think the underlying theme is is we are beginning to look at a new hiring process that is going to have to come into play in order to meet the demands of the market today for new developers. It cannot, uh, we, you know, organizations cannot lo- can no longer say, okay, we're just going to recruit from the top schools with the top GPAs. There's too many roles to fill. And there is a lot of hidden talent out there. So how, how are we transforming the hiring process from looking at just a resume uh, to a more comprehensive candidate profile that's focused on skills? Mm-hmm. Great question, Laura. Um, so I, th- I think it's pretty apparent that um, at this day and age, resumes don't tell the full story um, about a candidate. So being able to find ways to understand a candidate's skill set, um, like Maria said, they're, everything that they, they've learned is not going to be able to be put on a piece of paper. Um, it's not just you went to this specific school and you learned these specific languages or frameworks. There's so much more than that. Um, so getting to know the candidate, finding ways to automate the process to, to learn their skills um, becomes super valuable, um, especially if you have sometimes thousands of applications that come into your inbox or you're sourcing thousands of candidates, you have hundreds of roles to fill. Um, you know, Automating that process is super important. So um, finding a way to, to evaluate those skills um, without that bias and that manual process becomes super important. Um, you do have to be cautious, though, that the automated process you've built doesn't naturally create an unconscious bias itself. <laughs> so um, it constantly takes um, kind of some fine-tuning, reflection, look back to that strategy, um, and make any adjustments that you need to make. Um, but yeah, the, the concept of just looking at a resume and making a decision off that, uh, we, we're starting to see that really go away. And I think there's a few other things that people can take into consideration as they uh, they begin to uh, look to attract these young, new young developers. So um, in our most recent student developers report, we were we found that uh, professional growth and learning really tops the chart uh, for what what younger people are looking for as they they enter into the job market. They want to find a job that will allow them to continue to grow and learn. Work-life balance, of course, is important. And I think the other piece that becomes um, becomes uh, important as you're looking to talk to these these students is they want interesting problems to solve, but they want to do so in a company that mirrors their culture. So, so taking all of this into consideration when you're you're going out to talk to these people becomes incredibly important. So, if you are talking about how your people are going to have to be on call 24/7, or that um, there is one problem to solve and everybody has to be dedicated to solving that one issue, it may not necessarily resonate with the, with the students. Um, making sure that you've got a workplace that's going to appeal to this new culture, these new values that these students are bringing into the marketplace is incredibly important. Absolutely, and you know the company has done a really great job of 
um, come up with a great employer branding to be able to attract the talent um, and developers coming on site. And what we need to do more so in that, we actually have to sell the company value and the mission, right? So what are we trying to achieve? What is our overall corporate mission that we are out there? And that's going to be very key to getting them um, continue to be engaged with, with the company. Um, it has to resonate with them in terms of their overall values and, and their culture and the kind of environment that they want to work in. So in addition to the matching the skill set of the roles, we also have to match with them in terms of what their interests and values are and vice versa, the, what we're looking for in a company with them as well. Mm-hmm. So it has to be a, a, the right match. Yes, yes. And there's definitely some interesting stories out there about what <laughs> Gen Z is looking for. Um, Can I chime in on that real quick? Yeah, um, yeah so I, I think that's really interesting because um, one thing I hear from a lot of candidates when we're going through the interview process is that they love the transparency. Um, I think that's a, a big key factor. Um, you want you want the candidate to be the right fit for the company, but at the same time, the candidate wants to feel that you're at the right fit for them, <laughs> right? Yeah, so right. Um, the more transparent you can be in the interview process, what the expectations, what the skill sets they're looking for, and if if they feel they don't have those skills, maybe they'll opt out themselves, right? So I think uh, transparency in the interview cycle is, is super important to this as well with this generation. Yep. Well, and that's a great segue into uh, what what is it that turns a Gen Z developer off from employers? So uh, <laughs> number one is the is, is the lack of clarity uh, on the role or where they'll be placed within the organization. So using a, a role-based assessment uh, will will definitely help candidates understand what's going to be expected of them on a day-to-day basis. Um, And then, of course, the other pieces that are turning Gen Z developers off are there's uh, not enough prep for what to expect or what the process is. So, Blaine, as you just Mm -hmm. mentioned, having a clearly defined process is incredibly important. And then um, a lack lack of or slow follow-up. That's a this market is so competitive, candidates are not going to sit around and wait a week or two for somebody to get back to them. They're going to move through the process and take the best opportunity that comes available to them first. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So more and more companies are actually using more automated process, and so which actually speeds up the entire recruiting process altogether from very beginning to the very end. Therefore, it is much more imperative for us to actually be keen on um, getting back to them very quickly. They're, you know, It's a very hot market that we're in, of course, and so even for them to wait a few days, it seems like a long time. And so there's always this, this um, sense of rush and urgency that we need to have with our candidates because if you lose by them by a day, it, it's going to be very harmful. And I can speak to that too. We uh, we have a couple customers where um, you know their their goals with HackerRank specifically have been to standardize the hiring process, right? So they built a hiring strategy around implementing a, a coding assessment. In this example, um, one of the one of the outputs that they found was that they actually reduced the time to hire um, from a month and a half down to closer to a month. Um, so that signif- has significant impact on their business in general, right? They can start building the products that they need to faster. Um, and the candidates that they're working with are, are able to find a job a little bit quicker. And so that's an example where I think where Maria's right, the automation can um, can help in a couple of different ways. So shift gears a little bit. We have spent a little bit of time talking about why brand is more important than ever before. And in our most recent uh, Women in Tech report, we found that Gen Z women are twice as likely to seek out an employer with a press with a prestigious brand as women from previous generations. So Maria, you you touched on this a little bit earlier in our conversation. Can you share some uh, insights that we have around why they might be looking for this prestigious brand? Yes. So, you know, as as Blaine also alluded to, the Gen Z um, generation um, has has had smartphones um, in their hands before they turn 10, uh, which is unheard of. I mean, I don't remember when was a, my first day or first time I actually got the phone in my hand. But so you're talking about a Gen Z that actually had been using smartphones from a very young age. Uh, and they have spent most of their lives surrounded by and engaging with these large brands like Twitter and Snapchat and Apple um, that really does have a strong online presence. So for smaller companies, this means that you really need to have a much more active and engaging social media presence and accounts in order to build a large following and capture the Gen Z um, women's attention. And, you know, that's something that, you know, even for me, thinking about social media, you know, and, and, attract, and trying to get our name on our company out there, that is actually a new recruiting strategy for us. We never really had to think about Instagram, right? Mm-hmm. We've, of course, LinkedIn and Facebook's other world, but, link, you know, Instagrams and Snapchats, those are becoming
becoming much more popular in terms of gaining employer branding out there, which has been great. So in addition, um, to establish your tech brand, you need to create a clear and concise careers page. Um, you know, as we talked about before, um, job descriptions on the pages often highlighting company um, tech stacks and perks are no longer um, you know, what they're interested in. So making it much more lively to talk about the company mission, the branding, um, and what we're set out to do, our mission, our values, are what they're going to be um, much more um, interested in in terms of that brand. So what should we focus on? Show the candidates what it's really like to work at the company. Make it fun and vibrant. What are different events that, that we're part of? Of what are different mission or philanthropic initiatives out there, those are what they're going to be able to capture with us versus just your traditional way of, of the career pages that we've seen for a long time. Yes, definitely in the Silicon Valley, we see that uh, every company here offers free breakfast, lunch, and uh, <laughs> ping, pong ping pong for your break. Yes. <laughs> um, and so making sure that, that uh, of course, those are available, but then having the higher level values available for them to uh, uh, reach as well. Absolutely. Right. So once you've attracted these candidates, um, Blaine, you touched on this a little bit. Um, it, we, candidates do need to know what to expect during the interview process. As our research shows, uh, lack of interview prep is one of the biggest turnoffs for both gen, uh, for both men and women of the Gen Z. So letting candidates know what to expect during the interview process is extremely important. It's this lack of interview prep on the interviewer's behalf that is one of the big t biggest turnoffs for Gen Z mm -hmm. men and women. Uh, moreover, 66% of university students say they don't feel 100% confident uh, that they're ready for interviews. So what, uh, what, can it, what are companies doing today to make sure that they clearly uh, address this issue? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I think you can look at it from the other side, too, is are the interviewers actually prepped themselves, right, when they go into a, an interview? <laughs> so um, have they spent 15, 20, 30 minutes looking at the candidate's profile or their their assessment, um, sometimes if they use HackRank? Are they, are they prepared to talk about the candidate skills and, and dive deeper into... Uh, any sort of project or assessment they've already completed. So that's something we've been we've been hearing a lot from customers, um, and it, it 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 works kind of in two fronts. If if your interviewer is ready and prepared, um, they have a good understanding of uh, the candidate skill set. They have much more productive um, interview session. Um, they know if that candidate is more 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 of a fit for for the position for their company. Um, you know, you could take the role of let's just say entry level software developer. Um, that role could look very different at company XYZ versus company ABC, uh, depending on you know languages, frameworks, just the, the products they're building in general. So the more the interviewer can be prepped, they'll know, hey, this person is the right fit for our organization from a skills perspective. And then again, on the candidate side, um, they'll know that, hey, this, this interviewer truly valued my time. Um, I came into the office or I'm on the phone call. They spent their time learning about me. That's that's very valuable, right? So they come away with a very positive experience. And again, if it's a, a fit for both sides, then great, right? If not, we'll we'll go our separate ways. So um, I see that, that level of communication, uh, preparing, transparency, uh, just as important on both sides of the equation. Yeah. And to add to that, you know, it's also from the company perspective, um, very, very important for the recruiting team and the hiring managers to be also be prepped. Um, you know, most a lot of times we go in with different panels that are asking the same questions. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the candidate experience perspective, it's not a good of time that, that they have spent in the company uh, answering the same questions over and over again. So it's very, very important that the recruiting team, the hiring team, the uh, manager's team actually come together to really strategize as to who is asking what, time frame, what the expectations are, what is, are they going to be getting out of each interview, so that there's mo a lot more prep and transparency across across that. Um, and again, ultimately, it's also about the kind of experience, right? How they're, how are they going to be viewing the company? Because ultimately, if they don't get the job, whether they decide not to, you know, pursue it um, further, or they, you know, do not get an off actual offer, the overall candidate experience that they'll be able to mm -hmm. share with their friends and their colleagues, that's a huge organic growth and shift as well in terms of employer branding. That's just a very easy and cheap way for us to actually gain more attention in our um, employer branding efforts. Don't avoid those bad, bad glass door reviews. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So really, in summary, I think when you're when you're talking with the Gen Z, focusing the conversation around what problems the new hires will be solving, that they'll have interesting challenges in front of them, that uh, their impact in the company will be relevant, and they will have the tools and mentors available to them, uh, so that they'll be able to grow their skills through the throughout their time at your organization. 
So that brings us to the conclusion of today's program. So uh, we'll spend a little bit of time summarizing uh, what we spoke about today. So first, I think the big one is uh, that there's still a lot left to do to reach diversity in tech talent, you know, not only on the gender disparity, but even on ethnicity. We didn't dive into that too much today, but there are there's a lot of information around that today. And so, uh, Blaine, talk, if you were talking about the, uh, the standardized uh, recruiting and hiring process is something that can eliminate some of the bias that exists today. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, and then secondly, making sure that the stakeholders include a career growth plan in their early talent development strategy. So having this in place as you're talking to new recruits is incredibly important. <laughs> All right. Um, and then, of course, the importance of uh, making an active effort to cater your brand to young women and men in tech talent, uh, that the importance of your tech talent brand and steps that you can take to build that. Uh, then expanding your candidate pool in order to reach more diverse talent and um, defining that standard pro standardized process so candidates know what to expect during the interview process. And then finally, throughout the interview process, make sure candidates are aware of the problems that, they're, that they'll be solving within the organization as a new hire. So with that, um, we're coming to the conclusion of our program today. Uh, we have had several questions come in uh, uh, during our time together today, so we're going to dive into those. Uh, those now. And if we don't get to your questions today on the air, we will follow up with an answer over email. So the first one, knowing that students are open to many different opportunities going into their first role, how much do you value their passion for, this, for a specific company or a project? I guess it depends on why they're passionate about the company. If it's just more about the brand, yeah. right? I just want to work at X company right. because I just I think it's cool and it's hip and everyone wants to go there and if I get in, it's great. Right. That's a different set of passion versus you know, there is an actual life lesson or life, you know, what is it? there's an actual reason as to why yeah. they're so passionate about a particular company, that they really want to go in and actually make an impact. So going back to their notion of I want to, you know, do something interesting and I want something that matches to our culture, my culture and values, my internal values, if it matches to that, of course, we can't, you know, we can't scrutinize our passion. Uh, we can't, but... So we did spend a little bit of time talking about how important it is for the interviewers to be prepared for a session. So how do you choose who the interviewers within the organization should be? Yeah, so you know, really um, looking at the entire recruiting strategy, it is very, very important to assess who the interview panel are, are going to be. It, it's, it's due to the fact that you're going to really understand the job guidelines, right? What are what are the key criteria, key competencies that we're looking for in a in this, in this position? Um, and so then we need to really pinpoint what are the skills, what are the necessary requirements for this, and then be able to find someone that is going to be able to correlate with that. So you know, to be prepared for the candidates coming on is very important, but it's also very very important to actually really identify the the recruiting team that's going to be responsible for actually hiring or not hiring the particular individuals coming on site. All right, so we did get a question in. Will we get a copy of the slides? Yes, of course. If you are interested in receiving a copy of the slides today, please reach out to us. Um, if you go to hackerrank.com slash contact us, you can fill out a form there, and we'd be happy to help you with anything uh, that you might need. All right, so the next question that's come in is in regards to HackerRank customers. So how are HackerRank customers using assessments to qualify candidates? What are the key indicators they look for before moving uh, a candidate on to the next stage? Oh, good question. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of different ways that um, companies will utilize HackRank in, in their determining factor. Um, the first one is they'll, they'll initially set a, a cutoff score uh, for the test, uh, basically a, a kind of a pass-fail. Um, so if you score above 50%, historically we've seen those candidates do really well. Below 50%, we've seen those candidates not. So at some point they're able to determine um, what that right benchmark is or, or a cutoff score. Um, so they, they can automate that process a little easier. Um, some customers will also do a range where um, any candidate scores between 50 and 80% will do a manual review of the candidate's report. They'll look at their code. They'll try and get an idea of their thought process. Um, how they went about approaching that, that particular problem. Um, and then above 80%, that's kind of another automatic pass. 
So a um, couple of different approaches that we typically see. Uh, we do have some customers who have lower volumes where they can't afford to lose cans from the pipeline, so they don't implement anything like a path fail. They will actually review uh, the every candidate's code uh, because they can't afford to just eliminate candidates right away uh, based on an assessment. Um, that's also true for sometimes more mid to senior level positions, maybe positions that just have lower volume, um, even if you have a very strong brand. So a lot of it depends on on volume, the, the strategy, the uh, the workflows that you, you implement HackRank with. And what about security? How do, uh, how do customers ensure that it is the candidate that, uh, that's applying to the job that's actually taking the assessment and plagiarism? Yeah, good question. Um, we actually we encourage um, our customers to, again, be very transparent in the communication process with candidates, letting them know that, hey, after you, you take this assessment, a hiring manager is actually going to review, and when you come on site or when you do that next, next stage, you're going to get a chance to talk about your code. Um, that will immediately deter candidates from trying to cheat <laughs> um, or copy paste things like that because they know they're going to have to present what they what they've built or what they've written. Um, so um, we use that concept of transparency um, to make sure we also avoid plagiarism <laughs> or cheating. Um, so um, seems to be working well. And aside from hackering during initial phone screens, Maria, do you have any tips for non-technical folks to? gain insight into a candidate's technical ability? Um, yeah, so there may be times where we have um, interview panels that may not be as technical uh, and that are interviewing technical candidates. And so in any tips, tips um, obviously you're not going to be the subject matter expert in that, right? So it may, you know, depending on coding languages, you're definitely not going to be going into the, the weeds and in depth about a particular coding language. That's not what you're looking for. That's not what they actually have asked for you to be part of a panel for. Um, it's more around the ability to actually have them understand um, how they're able to uh, gain the technical skill set. So some of the tips could be some questions around, um, you know, what are the different means or ways that they've been able to learn a particular language or a platform um, from, 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 you know, not understanding or knowing anything at all. Um, that in itself gets the interviewer to really think through as to how they're able to come up with that process. So it's not just more about the skill set, it's how they're able to develop that. So it's a different competency that they're actually looking at mm -hmm. and, and interviewing for. So those could, those could be a, a good way. And what are some questions you've asked to gauge that competency? Yes, so um, some of the questions that, that we have asked is, tell me about a time that you actually had to implement a, a, a product or a project with a brand new um, you know, technology platform that you have not used, and how you came up with, with your process to actually understand it and to be able to implement it. Um, you know, what is a brand new uh, you know, platform that you um, use in a particular company, and how did you learn it on your own? Right. There's going to be a lot of different platforms or different um, you know, technical um, programs out there that we may not have full um, knowledge to, um, and therefore it's just a matter of how do we learn it. Yep, and then giving the answers that indicate that they, uh, they do have that desire for, to learn and uh, are, are trainable. Exactly, exactly. So where do, you, where do you typically recruit talent from? So there's the traditional places like referrals, LinkedIn, uh, and of course the ATS uh, application platforms, but are, are there any other channels that you could recommend? Yeah, I, you know, I think, again, having a very strong employer branding it really helps, right? If you're out there and engaging with different referrals and different networks and different um, conferences and different events, just to get your name out there and even just get your, you know, your network. I mean, you're, we're all trying to grow our own network and get be, you know, gain best practices and just getting the support from your fellow colleagues. Um, and that's been a really, really great way for us to be able to get the, uh, the additional referrals that you may not have actually had access to. Other ways that we've actually have gone through was, of course, universities. Uh, where, you know, as an example, you know, HackerRank is used in many universities um, in, in the world. And so we are definitely getting a lot more interest in, in act actually getting, um, you know, um, so we're actually getting a lot of interest in how they're able to, to apply um, because they have had such a great, um, strong uh, values and, and strong thoughts and, and experience with HackerRank, they actually want to be part of this organization as well. So again, going back to um, their, their oh, values. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And their values and what they would like to do. So that's been great. And Blaine, this question's for you. 
Where do you see customers implementing the assessment during their interview process? Is it something that they offer right up front or do they run a phone screen and then invite a candidate to take the test? Good question. Um, long answer. I'll keep it brief. Um, so there's there's a few different things that our customers will look at to determine when's an appropriate time to send an assessment. Um, a lot of it depends on uh, volume. Again, so do you have high volume or low volume? Um, another would be is are the candidates um, inbound? Are they applying through career pages or job boards? Um, or are you having to do mostly sourcing efforts? Um, you're reaching out to them via LinkedIn. Um, or even a referral. Um, the other would be uh, years of experience, so seniority level, junior versus senior. Um, you have to kind of take into account all three of those criteria um, to determine when's the appropriate time to send a test, if at all. Um, for us, we, we do help customers track um, what we call a invite to attempt ratio, so just basically a participation rate. Um, you want to make sure if you are utilizing an assessment platform um, you're not turning away candidates. So it's super important to position it at the right time. So um, again, you have to kind of think about volume, seniority level, and then um, inbound versus sourced. So you know, for university season that's coming up this fall, a lot of our customers will initially send that test right away. The, the volumes are so high, especially if you have a big brand um, and you're seeing thousands of applications, you're going to 10 different career fairs, there's too much volume to review resumes, to talk to every candidate, even if you did all the resumes are going to look the same anyway. Um, so getting that assessment out front right away is, is a really um, easy way to do that qualification. And you'll still see high participation rates because they're applying to work for you. Um, if it's, let's say, for a senior level data science position, there's not too many folks in the market, right? So you can't afford to just send them a test right away and potentially lose them from the pipeline. Um, they're very much in demand. They're getting reached out to 20 times a day. Um, if you add an assessment to that right away, they're, they're not going to respond. <laughs> so um, having that conversation with them first, learning what they're looking for in an organization, selling them on the company, maybe I shouldn't say selling, but um, giving them more information on the role, the types of projects they'd be working on, and then letting them know that, hey, every candidate goes through the same process. Um, would you be willing to spend you know, 60, 90 minutes on doing an assessment? Um, so different strategies for different uh, characteristics of candidates. All right. Well, and with that, we are at time today. So if we didn't get to your question on the air, we will follow up with you over email uh, afterwards. Please be sure to take our short survey before you leave. You'll see it pop up uh, as we close out today. And if you do have any questions or would like more information about Hacker Inc., please feel free to reach out to us at hackerinc.com slash contact us, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your time today, and we will talk to you again soon. And for the so, and for those of you who are interested in a short overview of our product, uh, we do have a, a quick demo here available to everyone. Uh, also, please be sure to check out the resource portion of our webinar console. We've got uh, links to the most recent reports, including the uh, Women in Tech report and our developer, student developer report. And with that, we'll go ahead and hand it over to Blaine. Blaine, let's uh, take a look at what HackerRank can do. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and log into HackerRank. Let me to this in. login page. I can click login. And so this is going to take me directly to the, the HackerRank landing page, uh, essentially the HackerRank dashboard. Uh, our home page is essentially uh, will be showing your list of tests. Um, again, tests are typically created uh, depending on the role, uh, depending on the position that you're hiring for. Uh, so your engineering teams will be creating these tests uh, specific to those roles. Um, for the sake of, of this demonstration, what I'll do is go ahead and show how to create a test from scratch. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so if I click up here on the top right, um, I'll get this landing page that pops up. Um, and I can actually select which role this is going to be used for. Uh, so I'll go ahead and select software developer. Um, and we'll go ahead and say this is for someone with zero to two years of experience. Um, if I like to, I can go ahead and add a job description link. Maybe this is from the career page. Um, this is optional. Uh, up to you if you want to add this. Um, let's say I want to change the test name. We'll say SDE level one. 
and uh, I'll go ahead and make the duration of the test around about 60 minutes. Um, best practices, usually we see tests anywhere from 45 to 90 minutes. Um, you want to make sure you're able to ask enough questions to candidates, so typically uh, anything above 45 minutes will allow that. Um, anything longer than 90 minutes, um, it might feel a little bit daunting to the candidate, so we usually recommend keeping the, the test length under the 90 minutes. You also have the ability to use a predefined test or build your own custom test. Um, with the predefined test, we will go ahead and uh, look to the criteria that's populated here. Uh, so software developer and zero to two years of experience, um, as long as 60 minutes. And we'll pull questions that are relevant to that role and that seniority level uh, from our library of questions. Um, you can also build your own from scratch as well. So I'll go ahead and do a predefined test um, and show an example of what that would look like. Um, so this is pretty standard. Um, our, our library, our, our system will typically pull a couple of coding questions with some multiple choice questions. Um, and again, given this is 60 minutes, this is typically how we, we see tests being structured. Um, they will range in difficulty. So we have some easy and medium questions for this particular role. Um, and then we'll at the top give you a little instructions on how we actually came to, to do that choice. Um, so as you can see up here on the top left, left side, this test is currently in draft mode. That means it is not ready to be sent to candidates, so it means it's still being edited. Um, we can go ahead and pretend that this test is ready to be sent, um, and your engineering team has kind of given the approval that uh, this can go to external candidates. In that case, I can go ahead and click publish, and that would allow this test to actually go live. And what you'll see is that the, the publish button just turned into an invite button. And so I can go ahead and click invite. And this will take me directly to the, the invite landing page. Um, so this is where recruiters will mostly live. Uh, when you have an individual who needs to get access to a hacker and test, you can go ahead and just enter their email address here. Um, we'll go ahead and say Blaine at HackerRank. And you can add multiple email addresses, Blaine plus one at HackerRank. Right. So if you have a large batch of candidates, you can also do a bulk upload as well. Um, I believe we support up to 500 invites at one single time. Um, we also have the ability for you to uh, um, put in your own template as well. So just like you're using templates through your applicant tracking system, and you probably have a very standard set of communication to candidates, um, you can go ahead and edit your templates here in the platform as well. Uh, so it will automatically populate here. So hi, um, please take this test. Um, obviously, you want to have a little more communication than that with candidates, um, but please feel free to use your own custom templates that you guys are, are currently using. Um, we do recommend over-communication to candidates just so they uh, are familiar with what's expected of them um, and try not to position it as a test, um, but rather an opportunity to showcase their skill set. Um, we do have some other little settings up here as well, which you guys can look through. Um, you can choose to have an expiration on the invite. For example, if you talk to the candidate and you let them know, hey, you know, we'd love for you to take the test by the end of this week, um, which is maybe two days from now, you can go ahead and set an expiration. Um, and you can also set a reminder for the candidate. So um, the day before it expires or after one single day, you can go ahead and set an expiration on that as well, or a reminder email to the, to the candidate. Um, there's some other little features here is if you want to actually see uh, the email that's sent to the candidate, you can go ahead and, go ahead and send a copy uh, to yourself. Um, by default, we will always mark include the test link in the email, which is this big green start challenge button here. Uh, that allows the candidate to actually enter the test um, and then start and end dates as well. Um, in the event that there's a specific start and end date for a particular test, that would be shown here as well. Um, and a lot of that lives in our advanced settings within an individual test. Uh, we won't get into that today, but uh, please reach out to your customer success manager or your representative, and they can walk you through that as well. And cool. So once I'm done with this, I can go ahead and send this to the candidate. I'll go ahead and click send, and that's really it. Um, the candidate will receive an email, um, and then they'll be prompted to click that uh, start challenge button, and they'll be taken into the candidate landing page to, to go ahead and start the test. Um, once they do go ahead and take the test, you will receive a notification. Um, the recruiter who sent the invite by default always receives a notification. Um, you can also change some of the administrative settings as well and add some other folks that you would like uh, to see those notifications. Uh, oftentimes it's the hiring manager for more low volume roles if they would like to uh, be notified every time a candidate completes a test. Um, what I'll do to, to show a candidate report, I'll go into this more robust challenge that we have here. Um, so once you receive that notification, you can either click in the link there to see the candidate report, or if you're on the HackRank platform, you can go ahead and either click into the test here, or just go ahead and click in this completed state. 
and then it will take me into an aggregate view uh, of candidate performance. So I'll go ahead and just sort by score to start um, and see who performed the best in this particular case. Um, so what I'll go ahead and do is look at the top candidate. Um, if I want to actually get a detailed view of how they performed, uh, we provide a lot of insight uh, for both recruiting and engineering teams to, to get a really good sense and gauge on candidates' performance and skill set. So um, there are some core fundamental criteria that we will ask candidates, uh, name and email. Um, you can ask other criteria as, as well, um, completely customizable. Um, that would be present in the candidate landing page. Um, and then you can see real briefly how long it took them to take the assessment. Um, over here on the right, you can see how they performed on a percentage and then on a point value as well. Um, ideally, the engineering teams and recruiting teams are uh, collaborating quite frequently and have a really good understanding of what that what's that benchmark score? What is what is a quality score look like? Right. So maybe that's anything above 70 percent are people that you choose to talk to anyone who scores above 95 percent. Maybe that's directly to an on site interview. Uh, but ultimately, that will be benchmarked and, and calibrated uh, internally with the team. Um, if I want to go ahead and look at some notes, um, any notes that the team wants to leave, uh, perhaps the engineer uh, reviewed the candidate and they want to go ahead and leave a note, this person was great, please bring them in. Um, they can do that here. A lot of that communication will also live within your applicant tracking system, uh, so use this as you wish. Um, down here is where I can actually see how the candidate performed on each individual question. Um, so if I actually want to view a detailed report, I can go ahead and click detailed. And that will take me to the detailed tab as well. Um, and this is where uh, the, the kind of the really core functionality of our, of our platform exists, where you can actually play back uh, some of the candidates' code. And you can see how they performed over time. This is a very basic level question. Um, so the candidate did not have much change to their, to their code. Um, however, if, if more changes would occur, um, you'd see the more, um, more movement as we have scrolled along the, the scroll bar here. Um, so it looks like the candidate got a perfect score on this. Um, if I scroll down to the next question, um, I'll actually see um, an example of plagiarism. Um, so our system will automatically flag plagiarism if a candidate's code matches another candidate's code up to 70% or greater. Um, it's simply a flag. It's not a guarantee that they are cheating or copy pasting. Um, but along with the, uh, the fact that you can see the candidate's code over periods of time, you'd see if they actually did copy paste. Um, we don't actually see pl plagiarism most frequently unless it's in the 80th or 90th percentile. Um, depending on the difficulty of the question, there's only sometimes so many possible solutions, and so the odds of plagiarism greatly increases. Um, so it's simply a flag. It's not a, uh, not a guarantee, uh, but we will show the, uh, the plagiarism suspects, if you will. Um, so I can continue to scroll through and see how they answer some of the other questions. Um, Keep going, then we look like we get to some multiple choice questions. These are pretty straightforward. And that's the end of the test. Um, if I want to get a gauge on where the candidate actually spent their time within a test, um, sometimes this is super important um, as you want to see maybe where the candidate struggled. You know, where did they spend the majority of their time? Um, you can actually log in here and see, you know, see that. So it looks like they started on question one answer that question in its entirety, went to question two, and just progressed through the test pretty nicely. Um, it looks like they did go back to question three towards the very end, and question number four, maybe just to double check their answer, maybe they didn't feel you know, certain about that particular question or their solution, um, and then they finally submitted the test. Um, one of the more common questions that you'll get is, I did not have enough time to complete the test. Um, in the event the candidate actually lost internet connection or anything of that nature, uh, we will actually add another, uh, another, another row down here that says offline, and you'll actually be able to see if the candidate was offline at, at any period of time. So that's kind of an overview of, of the candidate report. Um, typically what we see, um, and, and our best practices kind of state, that there's two instances of HackerRank um, as you go, as you take the candidate through the recruiting workflow. Uh, one is this initial test to kind of test for those core fundamental skill sets. Uh, but the second stage is, is more of a, what we call a code pair session, where you're actually interacting with the candidate in real time. Um, so if I go back to this candidate summary page, I can actually spin up a code pair session uh, right from right here. Um, so take me to this another invite page, and again, this is specifically for code pair. Um, I can go ahead and select the interviewers that I would want to participate. By default, the candidate's information is here. Um, so let's pretend that I would like these three people to show up. 
um, in the interview. I'll go ahead and say myself and Rithika, and we want the, the day to go ahead and be this Friday uh, for one hour. Um, I can go ahead and upload the resume if I want the interviewer to be able to see that individual uh, resume before they go into the session. Um, what I can also do is just simply copy paste this particular link um, and send it in an email. I can put it in a calendar invite. Uh, completely up to you if you want to just use the link or if you'd like to actually send a formal uh, email invite. Um, but essentially the, the email invite will contain that link. So I'll go ahead and go to that link now. Um, and what you'll see is this is me as the acting as the interviewer. Um, and the candidate would be logged into the same exact environment as well. So we'd be seeing the exact same thing on the screen. Um, as the interviewer, most likely I've already determined um, a set of questions that I like to ask of candidates, and hopefully that's something that's standardized across the organization. Um, you know, these are the five or ten questions that we, we will use for code pair. Um, and so I can go ahead and select questions from that particular bank. Um, you have access to our library questions as well. So I'll go ahead and choose this particular question. It'll populate on the left-hand side. And as you can see, it provides me with a coding environment. In the event, I want to change the language. Uh, so again, this is the interviewer, uh, but the, uh, the candidate would be seeing the exact same thing. So they would have the ability to change the language they would like to code in as well. Um, as you can see, we automatically populate the code stubs and functions for the candidate to go ahead and get started. Um, if you want to give them a blank canvas, you can do that as well. Um, one of the really cool things about the platform is we do have a video and chat feature, so you can actually interact with the candidate in real time. So um, traditionally, this, this session is being done remotely um, and taking place of a lot of those on-site round-robin interviews, or at least before you have those, um, so you really make sure that candidate has the skill set, they have the communications, they'd be a good fit for the team. Um, so um, we see CodePair most frequently used following that initial uh, code screen test. Um, in the event you want to leave notes on a particular candidate, you can go ahead and do that. These are internal, and only the, um, only the interviewers and recruiters would be able to see these notes. So perhaps it's, you know, this candidate was great, please bring them in, right? So you know as a recruiter the next stage is you're, it's up to you to bring them on site and get them scheduled. Um, oftentimes it's as simple as a thumbs up or a thumbs down, so I can go ahead and, and give that as well. Um, before I, I gave that feedback, perhaps I actually wanted to test the candidate's code. Um, so I'll go ahead and just say test, test. Um, as you can see, uh, we provide a real environment here. I'll go ahead and run the code. This is not the correct solution. So uh, we should see an error, which we do. Um, so you can actually work through this with the candidate in real time. So you get a really good sense of their, of their abilities um, from both the test as well as the interactive uh, code pair session. Once I'm done, I can go ahead and complete the interview. Um, I just say end interview, and then that would be it. And then it would be up to the recruiter to, to contact the candidate. Are we going to move forward? Um, are we not? Um, so that's a quick overview of HackRank. I hope that was helpful. And uh, Okay, great. Thank you very much, Blaine. All right, and everybody else, thank you very much for your time today. We hope that you will join us uh, during our next program. We do have a few more events coming up. But please visit HackRank.com slash resources and you'll see a list of, uh, of upcoming activities that you might be able to participate in. Of course, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to help you with anything that you need. And again, thank you very much for your time today. Have a good one. Bye-bye.